Hey guys, this is Uncle Doug with Fellowship of the Martyrs, a ministry here outside of Kansas City. FOTM1 on YouTube, if you'd like to subscribe, we'd appreciate it. And uh, I am doing, um, I've done a bunch of videos recently about the International House of Prayer and um, its collapse and failure of leadership and whatever. And I don't, I don't mean for this to be a video specifically about that. Um, but there is a whole stream of Christianity that they're connected to, uh, Hillsong, Bethel, whatever, that um, I guess this relates to. I've been thinking a lot about uh, about what's wrong with churchianity. The excesses and abuses and the rolling on the floor laughing, not just the charismatic, but even in the other um, sort of more mainstream denominations like the Baptists. And I guess it's something I've known all along, but I'm starting to connect more with how specific teachings erode fear of the Lord. If fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom then familiarity with the Lord is the beginning of a downfall, is the beginning of foolishness, and opens the door to the flesh and all kinds of nonsense that comes from the flesh. You cannot, no way, no how, get your head around how big God is. You can't, with the biggest telescope we have, see out to the end of his love or wrath, mercy or justice. I am constantly trying to explain to people that we are ants in an ant farm looking out the glass at the giant face looking in on us telling each other that we know what he had for lunch what his motivation is and how he thinks and how he does things in fact we've got him all bottled up in a five point Calvinist five point Arminian whatever plan and we know that he only speaks in King James English and um, uh, that, that, that he's jealous for us, that he can't seem to live without us, that he is like the hurricane and we're like the tree and wet sloppy kisses and bridal paradigm and all this other stuff so that... Uh, he loves us like a boyfriend. He loves us like a lover. He is pretty much about just like us and an equal, except he's far more desperate for us than we are desperate for him. And all of it is hubris. It's a ginormous lie. Excuse me for a moment. Buttercup. Dopey little dog in the other room, barking, barking. Still will, probably. I didn't close my office door. We don't have near enough fear of the Lord. The Lord has sort of locked me here in the United States for years, which is like the hardest mission field on the planet. Because everybody thinks they're rich and have need of nothing, even though they're blind, rich, and naked, and poor. And they need to repent, but why should they repent? Because they're just fine, and everything's great, and we're America. America. One day I was lamenting. And I said, Lord, uh, 
in the age of the hair club for men and computers, I don't think they're impressed that you know every hair on their head. There's not enough fear of the Lord in this country. He says, tell me about it. I said, what can I tell them that will explain to them how big you are? He said, you know quarks? I'm like, yeah, I know quarks. Protons, electrons, neutrons, muons, quarks. Like the smallest thing we've identified. Trillions of them passing through your body at every moment. And uh, I know quarks. He said, every quark has a personal name. And I know its name, and I know where it started, and where it's going to end, and everything it bumps into in between. Is that big enough for you? Serial numbers? Bob. Mike. Fluffy. Wow. Wow. I mean, a hundred decimal places worth of quarks in the universe not just quarks atoms electrons neutrons every leaf every snowflake every drop of water uh, every every skin cell where I left it <laughs> when I left it what it's doing there where it's going to be where it's going to go everything wow How could that God not know what I should have for lunch or what shirt I should wear today? I've had him tell me that kind of stuff regularly. I got to get permission to go to the Chinese buffet. When I do, I got to get permission about what to put on my plate. That's a real relationship with a real living Savior that directs all your paths. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust the Lord your God with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. That's real. That can happen. His sheep hear his voice, and we're supposed to be directed by him. And even though he's great big, and the creator of all, and far beyond what we can fathom, he knows that if I wear that particular shirt, I'm going to get that particular guy's attention, and we're going to get a chance to talk about Jesus. If I wear the blue shirt without lettering on it, it's not going to happen. So that day he tells me to wear that shirt, to have that appointment, I've seen it lots and lots of times. Or you could just bump around doing what you think the Bible says you should do. God puts on my heart to give a sister money. I pray more or less than 50 bucks. More. More or less than 75. Less. Keep asking questions. I give her $75.13, the exact amount for her water bill that she's been praying for. She knows that was the Lord. He gets glorified. I give her 100 bucks. I'm a nice guy. I give her 50 pretty close. I give her to the penny. That's just God. That's just God, and he gets all the glory. That's my regular life. Could be your regular life. If you'd stop directing your own paths and let him in and listen to him and do whatever you got to do to get everything out of the way so you can hear him. But mostly we hear the pastor. And the pastor hears his seminary professor. And the seminary professor hears Luther or Calvin or, or some other person. Mary Baker Eddy or whoever. And we think the pastor's hearing God, but he's not. He's just recycling what he was taught by somebody else who wasn't hearing God. And they're not teaching us how to have a relationship with God where we can hear and be directed by the creator of the universe. And when we are, we have fear of the Lord. In Exodus 20, they had just the, the children of Israel had just come out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea, seen all kind of miracles. They're at the bottom of Sinai. There's a cloud with thunder and lightning at the top of the mountain. He has them fast for three days, and then God speaks to all of them and gives them the Ten Commandments. And the elders are terrified. And they go to Moses and say, Don't have him talk to us like that anymore. We will die. And Moses says, he's just trying to test you so that the fear of the Lord will keep you from sinning. Oh no, we don't want to hear him like that. 
It was awesome and powerful and terrifying. And if we heard him like that all the time, we would die. Yeah, you'd die to self. Die to sin. How are you going to look look sexy at your at your neighbor's wife when a voice from heaven says, Yo, what are you doing? You're not going to get away from anything. If, if, if God is talking to everybody like that all the time, he didn't give the Ten Commandments to Moses. He gave the Ten Commandments to everybody. And they, they don't want to hear him like that. So they say to Moses, you go up the hill and talk to him and ask him what he wants, and we'll listen to you. But we don't want to hear him like that anymore. And Moses says, isn't that sort of a suicide mission? Didn't you just say you would die if you heard him like that again, and now you want me to go up and hear him? So Moses goes up the hill and says, I'm sorry, they don't want to hear you like that. God says, oh, for a people that would hearken to my voice so that I can bless them. But if you're not going to hear me on the fly, here's 600 and plus more laws they're going to have to go by, which they probably won't. And they won't, they'll disobey and they won't really do those either. But I could have been talking to him on the fly, explaining everything out on the, on the whatever. You know, maybe that selfish shellfish is okay to eat because it's fresh enough. But that one's not refrigerated. It'll kill you. Don't eat that one. But they're not going to listen. So I'm going to give them a one-size-fits-all giant package of laws that they're never going to really be able to obey. And maybe someday I'll send one like unto them in the flesh and they'll listen to him. So he sends Jesus, and we kill him as fast as we can. So he sends the Holy Spirit, and as fast as we can, we convince people that the Holy Spirit doesn't talk to people either, and you have to listen to the pastor. And the people say, Moses, you ask him what we want, what you, what he wants, and we'll listen to you. Because Moses is easy to ignore. And they pretty much always ignore him. And then God spanks him, and then they pay attention for a little while, and then they don't, and then God spanks him over and over and over all through Judges and Chronicles. And today, a doctrine has spread all over the church that God doesn't talk anymore, that the Holy Spirit doesn't direct you, that you have the Bible and the pastor, which are both pretty easy to ignore. But once you start hearing God talking to you, and you ignore it, then you're in really big trouble. And it's hard. The closer you get to God, the bigger he gets. The more awesome, the more powerful, the more fearful he is. The harder it is to ignore him. The thing we have in common is that we all see through a glass darkly. We're all ants. We're all pretending we know what he wants. When really none of us, his ways are not our ways. I don't care how enlightened you think you are. The thing we have in common is that we ought to all hit our knees and cry like babies and, and for our hubris and pride and thinking we ever understood him and just let him be God however way he wants to be God and shut up and do whatever he says. So, how's this all come back around? If God turns you over to a strong delusion, you're going to think you're right. And fear of the Lord is going to work counter to that. So you're going to reduce God down to some manageable bite-sized portion that you can take control over. Maybe he's not mad at you because you said the sinner's prayer, and no matter what you do, he's still going to take you. Maybe it's a bridal paradigm kind of thing where he's in love with you, and he's your boyfriend, and he's desperate for you, and he's just has got the same motivation and loneliness and desperation that you have. Uh, maybe he's just a dad that, uh, you know, uh, that, that you can sing positive affirmations about. That uh, I'm loved, I'm loved, I'm blessed, I'm so blessed, every day I'm blessed because he's just that kind of God that all he wants to do is just bless me, bless me, bless me. But all of it, at any time we make him smaller, we make us bigger. So that he seems more relatable. And if he's relatable, he's dismissible. 
and we can decide that he's he's not really that angry. He's not really that serious. Maybe he loves us so much, he won't mind if we hire prostitutes and get drunk every night and do whatever it is we want to do. Maybe we're just so special and so important to the Lord that he'll look the other way and take us no matter what we do. All we're doing is taking a giant boulder of the Holy Spirit and whittling away at it until it looks like us. And when it looks like us, we don't have to pay attention to that. We make New Year's resolutions we don't mean and never do. We commit to diets we can't keep. We promise all kind of people stuff we don't do. We take marriage vows we don't intend to keep. If we can, if we can knock him down to our size, then we can force him into whatever image we want of him and make him do whatever we're wanting him to do. If we get enough kids praying, by repetition, we'll move him and he'll have to do it. We don't sing, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. But for him, the enemy ranges and would eat us but for God. We don't respect him or we would obey him and we would know that his ways are right. Not so that we could be saved, but because his ways are right. And whatever he says should go, period, that's the end of the discussion. Because he designed this whole thing, he wrote the manual, and he knows what's best. But if we could just go to church on Sunday, and the guy with a tie that we hired stands up there, we can pretty well ignore him. He's just reading out of a book written by a bunch of men thousands of years ago. But when you hear the voice of God, and you know it's God, and the thunder's in your head, or a dream, or a vision, or a visitation to heaven, or a Christophany, I know a bunch of people. Jesus showed up in person, as real as anything, and gave him a hug or told him what to do or something. Me included. Go watch the video, Doug Met Jesus. And when I met Jesus, I was completely aware of my blackness, of the darkness in me. And I thought I was okay at that moment. I thought I was forgiven up, was walking clean. But compared to Jesus, no way. As he got closer and closer, I wasn't condemned. I wasn't worried about hell. I wasn't trying to justify my own sin. My only thought was that I was terrified that I might somehow corrupt his perfection. That if he got too close to me, some of my dirt might stick on him. And it would be the most horrible thing ever that I might somehow discolor his perfection. And I begged him to go away, and he got closer and closer, and let me see through his eyes that everything was perfect. Everything in the universe was tied up with a bow. There was no injustice. Every Every molecule, every star, every everything was handled perfectly. And I can't explain to you how kids starving in Africa or um, birth defects or wars or anything else are okay. But justice was done somehow. 
in every single case. Nobody could say they got shortchanged. Nobody could say they got they got spanked one time too many. Nobody could say that their enemy didn't get spanked. And then I wept and wept and wept for the beauty of him. So much of churchianity has become about pleasuring ourselves, about bread and circuses. Get fed, be entertained, feel good, prosperity gospel, roll on the floor, barking, laughing, joking, token the Holy Ghost, something. And so little of it is about repentance, confession of sin, fear of the Lord, obedience to his commands because they're right whatever your plan for your life it's wrong the creator of the universe has a plan for your life and it's the only right one he's the only one that knows what's the best thing what your destiny what your what what whatever you want to call it is for you so many people are under a delusion and the delusions always seem to be self empowering self aggrandizing self promoting self something so that you're big and he's little and that's just the same thing jumped on Lucifer that somehow he deserved to be bigger than God he should be in charge because he's smarter and better and knows best and should be allowed to direct his own paths and make his own decisions and recruit his own helpers and whatever else it's, it's the lie from the beginning. I could be like God. Or maybe I am God. Or maybe I'm bigger than God. Or maybe something that makes that switches positions with him. And it's death. It's death. The right answer is always yes, Lord. Whatever he says, whatever he asks, whatever it costs, whatever you have to go through, the right answer is always yes, Lord, and thank you, Lord. Psalm 50 says, this is what I want. Fulfill your vows to the Most High. Cry out to me when you're in trouble. I'll rescue you, and you can praise me. Just do what you promised him you're going to do. And if you said, Lord... That means king, boss, commander, husband, in charge all the time, from now on, of every detail, period. And do what you got to do so that you can hear him and he can direct you all the time. But don't think for a minute that you get to be Lord. His power, his glory, forever, not yours, not ever, period. Whatever fear of the Lord I have. I pray the Lord to give you. Even if I don't get it back. That you would overflow. With an understanding of the bigness of God. Of how right he is. And how wrong you are in every circumstance ever. That his word is to be obeyed because he's right. Because he knows to defy him is like defying gravity. It's like wading out of the Pacific Ocean and telling it to stop slapping you around. No way that works. The Pacific Ocean doesn't even notice you. But God is personal and he cares and he loves you. 
and he's not a force of nature. He is everything in creation. Was just a breath, was a word to create everything far bigger than we can possibly understand. But he's personally loves us and he wants to direct all your paths. He's not a trifle. He's not a boyfriend. You're not to be played with. I pray that today he would give you something that gives you a sense of his bigness. In the name of Jesus. Amen.